good to be here, good to see everyone. Um, I got into uh, this, uh, I joined Greg Mahalik's uh, project at Aerospace to evaluate Jim's device and the principal. Uh, so it's, it's been a long road, but recently this spring I attended the American Physical Society meeting, Division of Gravitational Physics. These are the nation's experts gra in gravitation. Uh, they're the ones that detected gravitational waves. So I took this uh, concept, I believe, uh, the first time perhaps it's gone to this community. And I have, and I sort of rolled up in item one, uh, sort of some ideas, a way ahead, how to take this mainstream. So that'll be the first part of my presentation, sort of short, but I wanted to roll up those lessons and those experiences. Then I have a, a little interlude, uh, what I call the parable of Siyama. I know Siyama is important in a lot of this. I, I've discovered some interesting things about his views. And then in the final section, probably the half of the talk, we'll get technical. And that's with the title that I gave to Heidi and uh, why there is no Maxwellian gravity. And, and I'm not uh, making this up. So this is stuff in normal textbooks, well, Weinberg's textbook, Sean Carroll's textbook. So I'm not presenting any new results. When I talk about <laughs> why there is no Maxwellian gravity, it's just out of the textbooks. So, okay. So, uh, well, let me go back. Uh, so bringing inertial induction in from the cold. Uh, why do I say inertial induction? Inertial induction is the generic term that scientists historically use to refer to this concept. Coupling locally with uh, the distant universe. It was used in Bronze's 1977 paper on the topic, which I, I thank Jose for making me aware of. It was suggested in the Barber and Pfister proceedings on Mach's principle. Uh, yes? That uh, Brosinic had very different views. This was suggested by whom? Uh, Hubert Goner. It was in the discussions. Because they said, you know, what Machian effects, Mach's principle, it sounds like philosophy. Uh, Hubert Goner. Hubert Goner. I'm just saying that this is, you know, we don't need to uh, make up terms. There's already a word for what we're talking about that's known in the physics community. So this would be the basic pr principle if it exists underlying propellantless propulsion within the framework of our accepted theory of gravity, which is general relativity. So we're talking about local gravitational exchange of momentum with the distant universe. Uh, Mach effect, mega maga, these are all meaningless terms. Uh, if you go to some conference, no one will know what you're talking about. Uh, huh? <laughs> Uh, this is a make aeronautics great again, I think, oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so this is sort of the non-sexy term. This is the scientific term for what we're talking about. And by the way, this is believed to be impossible. And I'll get to more, that in a minute. Am I blocking your view? Can you guys see over? See okay over there? <clears throat> so what do I mean by the cold? I mean working outside of the mainstream of science and outside of the consensus picture of physical reality. Uh, and really avoiding presentations to skeptical peers, and, and I'm talking theory now, I realize there's an experimental part of this, but with regards to theory, if we're looking for this effect within the standard theory of gravity, you have to go to APS DGRAV. These are the guys that understand gravity and general relativity. These are the skeptical peers that could validate or falsify what we're working on here. Related uh, peer-reviewed journals of gravitational physics. So again, for, for us theorists, we should be submitting to physical review. Or Nature, Science, Astrophysical Journal. These are the top tier journals which... Yeah, exactly. Often that's review. who said it was going to be easy. You know, I mean, this is the path. Uh, I, I realize it's very I difficult. I fully agree with Lance, <laughs> and uh, we should do that. <clears throat> I, I had submitted to the astrophysical uh, and 
Space Science Journal, and uh, yeah. been under review now for nine months, and it's on second review. And I yeah. find the peer review process excellent, and yeah. all the comments have been first grade. Yeah. I want to second that from Rob Turner from NIAC, help you to fund this if any of you don't know who I am. One of my big objectives over the course of this year and next is to try to crack the um, skepticism and the, you know, that exists in trying to get this addressed in the mainstream literature. Yeah. So that's, that's going to be where a lot of my effort over the next yeah. year or two will be. And that's what I tried to do on behalf of aerospace with aerospace support. Um, I don't think it's a lost cause, but it will, it's not easy. It's easy to go to some conference where no one understands what you're talking about. It's very hard to take this to people who know general relativity who wrote textbooks on it. So, uh, so except being relegated to posters. Well, I know it's hard. I know I'm not saying it's not, but th this is this is there, there's only one path. <laughs> and new data yeah. as well. So ignoring new data. Okay, so I get. I'm going to reinforce it. Why should I bother going to APS and publishing in FizRev? Uh, there are people who've been studying gravity for 50 years and this topic for 50 years. So there might be something we can learn from these people. It's a hundred year old theory. Yeah. It's a hundred years old. Yep. Uh, and these are people who found a way to detect a force of nature so minute that it moved an interference fringe one one thousandth the width of a proton. So we're arguing about micronewtons and measure, you know, these guys measure things that are difficult to measure. Uh, probably this seems a lot more difficult than the things we're talking about. So these are open-minded people who have the capability to do these type of measurements if they can be brought on board. Excuse so again, well, a couple of years ago, about 10 years ago, I ran a high-frequency gravity wave conference. And in this conference, we invited a lot of guys from low-frequency gravity waves. And none of them would attend at that meeting. Yeah, it's tough. Likewise, if you go to a LIGO meeting, they will not accept anyone from a high-frequency gravity wave theory. They're narrow-minded, I find. Yeah. Well, is, is it, wasn't there a, a group called the Jasons that had a report on high frequency waves uh, uh, debunking the whole thing and that might be the reason as, why as a member I don't think it's, I'm not finished. And that is the reason why the, there was that reaction to your invitation? As a member involved in some of that in the peripheral, I gave the people of Jasons a thousand pages to look at high frequency gravity wave stuff. They never looked at any of it. They looked at only what they knew in terms of the conventional wisdom, and they destroyed any possibility of anything that was different from that. And I, that, I would, that's I just, inertial. Uh, that's <laughs> hard. Would, uh, you're making the point that this is very hard to get acceptance from the mainstream, and I'm not saying it's not. Okay. So, uh, but again, no one gets the stars alone. These are the people who can validate this theory. Uh, if a reporter hears about it, they're going to call the world's expert and say, what do you think about this? They're not going to call someone they've never heard of. If the world's experts don't know about it, uh, it won't be considered real. And uh, again, they can save you years of work in blind alleys, you know, just by talking to these guys. So I believe that avoiding, at least from a theorist perspective, that avoiding these venues is scientific dereliction. We're missing the opportunity to make great progress, have people understand our work, and so on. Okay, so here's, I'm just gonna wrap up this first section, how to bring inertial induction in from the cold, theory-wise. First of all, inertial induction is a well-known topic among gravitational researchers, goes back decades. So we can just pick up that thread. But according to Braun's absence of inertial induction in general relativity, uh, the Woodward device and the concept is impossible for the reasons that Braun's lays out in his paper. He also lays out those reasons in the 62 paper or 63 that Jim refers to. Cliff Will, when I approached Cliff Will at APS, he said the same thing. So, w this must be addressed. Uh, there is a mainstream reason why this is impossible, 
This is the brink of this is the brink of where we step up to the plate to swing a bat. Uh, this should be addressed, uh, Jim. The reason, the reason why it's why they say that's impossible is because the nature of Brown's argument. Brown's argument that in a closed laboratory you yeah. could not detect the presence of what well, he oh, called second spectator matter. Oh, I, I'm. I'm not, I'm not saying that there's not a reason or that someone can't explain it. I'm saying that we should go to the mainstream community and explain it. <laughs> so, yeah. We need the dialogue. I'm agreeing with Lance. We need the dialogue. Yeah. Just saying we need the dialogue. We can talk about the reasons later, but this is just the point that, you know, we step up to the plate and swing the bat. This is an issue. And everyone you talk to, huh? Unfortunately, they, they've been doing this for 50 years, and they think they're right. If, they tell, if you tell them that they're wrong, they won't listen to you. That's mm -hmm. I'm going, again, I'm agreeing with you. I think we all yeah. try to convince these guys. But sometimes, especially when they're like 80 years old, like Franz is, he's not going to change his mind. Yeah. I'm sorry, but he's, he's just not. So. But the, uh, science is not changing somebody's mind. Science is not authority. Science is to make the mathematical, physical arguments like Einstein did when he was in the patent office and he was not a professor in a university. And science is to do experiments. You convince people by the strengths of your physical argument. That's the difference between yeah. physics and sociology. Yeah. Sure. But, but it is imperfect, but the reason we are skeptical is because if we trust people, they can't, as we know, we can't be trusted. They, they make stupid mistakes, they're crazy, whatever. So we have to be skeptical, but then skeptical makes a problem. We have a, a big idea, no one wants to listen to it, but that's the price we pay. That's, that's what's called being a scientist. Uh, the human condition doesn't vanish from science. It's there in all its glory, but we're managing it. And that skepticism is an important part of it. So the issue is not to necessarily yeah. to convince brands, which who I, I talked to when I think he may be convinced. The issue is to convince the physical community at large, like Dr. Turner has said, right. to address this thing like last like Lance said. Yeah. If somebody here in the audience disagrees with, with this, is to write a paper and to make yeah. that, that argument. Yeah. My question is I I read about this being talked about and they said that if it was true, then shouldn't in the early universe when matter was closer together, shouldn't inertia have been stronger? And can that be tested in type 1A supernova? I mean, is... Well, we're getting into details now. Yeah, we can have that conversation, but I'm just saying that to ignore this skepticism is, you know, dereliction. We have to step up and confront this issue. So... Just a very, very quick comment. Okay. I have addressed this particular skepticism about the role of inertia and GR. It's in a James paper published last spring. It's yeah. called Einstein, Locke's Principle, and the Unification of Gravity and Inertia. So it's in a refereed journal. You know, it's not just read. Yeah. But however, to start. One thing, <laughs> one thing. Academia and EDU has been trying to get me to pay the money so I can see what they do. And they send me things and all that. And after that article came out, for several weeks, they sent me a thing saying the name James Woodward is mentioned 918 times in recent published work on yeah. academia EDU. Are you sure you don't want to sign up? Yeah, but uh, people referee in Jabus don't know general relativity, you know, like the guy's doing f his rev. So, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. <laughs> yeah, um, so when, when I got back from APS, I was, one thing was very clear. Our current theory of gravity, general relativity, is triumphant. It's unassailable. It's been verified and checked for a hundred years and it even gets stronger and stronger. And now, you know, general relativity is the top of the mountain. And so, if there is a path to a credible theory of iner inertial induction, that path is narrow. It has to run through the known laws of gravity. Anything else is going to be met with skepticism. Yes, yes. 
I mean, if, if you believe that general relativity, I mean, you can say, I'm going to invent a theory and then show that inertial induction comes from that, but why invent a theory? What's the experimental? It's in GR. It's in GR. And there's some general relativity. Yeah, so if, you, if it's in GR, then it has to depart from the known laws of gravity. Yeah, do you mean not depart? Do you mean not depart, must not depart, or depart? Must depart. I mean, depart means like I start in the calculation from. Maybe depart was a poor word, but it means I start with the known laws of gravity and then go to a new result. So it's not departing, it's actually. Yeah, so. <laughs> bad word. So you know what I mean. Start. Start from. Derived, derived from or evolves from. Yes. Or is consistent with. Yes. And so, so again, with Jim's equation and his work, I would call it heuristic. It sort of makes sense. It, it's, you know, it's not really violating any instincts, but it doesn't depart from the equations of gravity. So that's what's needed to really convince someone you can wave the hands and, and stuff like this, but then you actually have to go to the equations of relativity. And I got the word depart in there again, but it, it doesn't start from either the geodesic equation or the Einstein equations. So that's a problem. Also, alternative theories of gravity, like Coyle and Narlikar, Again, general relativity is triumphant, so we can postulate other theories of gravity, but there, you know, there's no evidence to think that. So if we want to talk about reality, this universe, I think we're stuck with general relativity. It is a narrow path. And if, if you did assume another law, or another Lagrangian, another theory, it would be sort of like a magical assumption because if you wanted to assume a theory that gave you the answer that you wanted, why not just assume the answer itself? Uh, well, that, that's correct, but uh, if, however, the, the spectrum of experiments so far are, for example, uh, for the data that is of astrophysical nature at such low frequency that is way below the frequency of Woolworth's experiments, and since we know that even according to Woodward himself, the, this is frequency dependent to a high nonlinear power, then uh, what's actually happening there is that the existing experimental data is not within the set where this effect will take place. I don't. I know what you're saying. Uh, this is saying if you assume different laws of gravity, that's not motivated. What are you saying? I don't I'm understand your comment. Where it says that alternative series of gravitation would be considered premature because there is no experiment that is not explained by GR. Uh, that is a, a weak statement. There are, there are many things that are not explained by GR that are extremely important. I can start enumerating them. There's a big problem with dark matter. Okay. There's, a big, there's a big problem with dark energy. There's a huge problem with the Big Bang, which is initially looked like was going to be solved by inflation, but now inflation is a very big problem. I can go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things with that are very of major scale, not minor, major scale, where GR has a big problem. That's why the community at large of physics, mm -hmm. the main universities, <coughs> are working on alternative theories <coughs> of gravity precisely because of this problem with GR. That's number one. Then number two, when we say that, for example, uh, conformal gravitational theory, like Omar Ricker and many others, are, are premature because they're not experiments that are not explained by GR, the experiments that, that substantiate GR up to the 1950s were extremely few. That was motivated DB in the 1960s. Uh, can I ask you to come to the point, just to, because uh, <laughs> They Just what I understand, you're saying that gravity, that cosmology poses some challenges to general relativity, so therefore it would be okay to assume another theory of gravity. Is that so? What you're saying? It's, it's, it's a whole gamut of theories of, of gravity, which are consistent 
with GR on the experiments that have been run to verify GR, which are very few, but they depart from GR concerning experiments that have not been able to be realized yet. Like frame driven. Well, I, that's a good counterpoint, and I wouldn't refute it, so, okay. yeah. Okay, so uh, the third point, and I'll get into that, a search for inertial induction in linear GR must be abandoned. And that's the technical part of our talk. Uh, and I'll t tell you the reason. The main reason is momentum exchange with weak gravitational fields occurs at second order in the field equations. So you can't describe the exchange of gravitational energy with a material system with linear field equations. Maxwell's equations are linear by definition, so the whole thing's out the window. And I'll, I'll show you more on this in a minute. Again, this is in the textbook. Uh, so. That's a very nice statement there. In what textbook is that statement? Uh, it's in. Yeah, I, I will get into the references, but it's in both of these. Uh -huh. and, I, and I can show Weinberg you. Has that? Huh? Weinberg has that statement? Hmm? Weinberg? Weinberg and Carroll and uh, Poisson and Will. You mean it's implied in Weinberg? Is that what you mean? Or it's said outright. Sorry? It's said outright, explicit. explicitly. Yeah. Actually, Poisson and Will had a big section on it, and that's where it caught my eye. Yeah. They, they go out of their way to say it, and then I went back to Carroll and Weinberg, and, and they sort of say it offhand. But, so it's an important point. So, I'm eager to hear Lance's development. Yeah. So uh, I've, a theory of inertial induction must be sought in an exact analytical solution to the Einstein equations, or a numerical simulation, or a perturbation treatment carried to second order. Can't do it with linear gravity. Okay, now I'm gonna put this up at the end of the talk because I wanted to tell you where it was all going. These are the conclusions. Now we'll go into why this is so, and then at the end we can judge whether these statements are defensible. So now I will do an interlude, the parable of Siyama. And uh, this is the perils of ignoring the known laws of gravity. And uh, it was very interesting, my reading on this. Um, so, this is how a scientist became entranced by the sirens of Maxwell and smashed his credibility on the rocks. <laughs> Dennis Siama. So, and that's Siama's boat. Uh, also, how another scientist also became entranced by the Maxwell sirens, but dragged himself free by force of scientific scruple and floated away on the care metric. John Wheeler. And he has a seaworthy raft. So, okay, so the laws of gravity, I'll put them up here. I know not everyone you know, reads these equations, the, the calculus and so on. But when I talk about the laws of gravity, I have to have something to point to, and a few of you do know them, so I'm going so that, so I can be specific. Um, this is uh, one way to look at these equations is with these indices. They they range over four values, and the free indices tell you how many equations. So you might think naively there's 16 equations here, but actually there's 10. So this compact way is writing 10 equations, the field equations, how gravity responds to matter. And then also, there's a force equation uh, that tells you how matter responds to gravity. These, this is it. This is general relativity. You have to start from one of these or both to get a credible calculation in general relativity. You mean there are 16 equations but because of symmetries, there are 10 independent equations. There are 10 independent, well, yeah, and we'll get to the independence, but yeah, there's 10 equations naively in 10 unknowns. Right. 10 equations, 10 unknowns. Here there's four, four equations. So these equations, obviously, we just said, pass numerous tasks. No situation has gone unexplained. Jose points out dark matter, dark energy, perhaps other things. Uh, however, the field equations are a bitch. Ten, these ten equations are nonlinear. They're coupled. 
Uh, partial differential equations, exact analytic solutions are very rare. So we know what the equations are, but we just can't solve them in general. So uh, this is what I said on my conclusion slide. Any theoretical investigation of inertial, inertial induction must depart from these equations to be credible within the known laws of gravity. So I want to just run through some quick milestones at GR to put the context. This is Siyama's parable, remember. So in 1915, those equations came out that I just wrote up. Uh, and the year, uh, the second, the, one year later, Schwarzschild found an exact solution for the gravity of a massive object. And then before 1920 or so, Einstein ran through the deflection of starlight, the perihelion of mercury, gravitational redshift, gravitational waves, made a lot of progress, and then nothing for like 30 years. So I call this the desert of general relativity. You can look, it ended around 1955. After 1955, it kicked back into gear. The Chapel Hill Conference happened, which is the, considered to be the, the start of modern gravitational physics. Uh, 1960, we gained an understanding of the singularity at, at the event horizon of a black hole. When Einstein died, he did not understand that. Uh, 1963, we got the solution for the gravity of a rotating mass. 65, we got the solution for a charge rotating mass. And then things started to break open. Starting in the 70s, we began numerical relativity solutions. Uh, the general relativity two-body problem was solved, which is two colliding black holes. This is the one-body problem, the Schwarzschild metric. The two-body problem is enormously complex. It took 30 years for them to develop the computer codes to run and converge. And they run in two parts. There's a set of elliptic equations on the boundary, and then it propagates the hyperbolic equations on the domain. Also, starting in the 70s, we got good textbooks on GR, like those that cover linear theory and gauge transformations and all the rabbit holes you can go down if you're not careful. And then the great uh, triumph was the detection of gravitational waves in 2016. So that's why I say general relativity is triumphant, but we had a desert in the middle. And out of the desert comes a man with a vision, Dennis Siyama. 1953, right at the end of the desert, uh, monthly notices, the Royal Astronomical Society. This is a pivotal paper, I believe, that influenced Jim and his uh, intuition. And when you read that paper, it's very strange. Uh, it's hard to understand why he did what he did, and I will put the logic of what he did. It's really this simple. He says, wow, you know, the gravity equations are really complicated. I'm not sure how to solve them. And this is 40 years after the Einstein equations were written down. So even 40 years, uh, 40 years later, still not sure what to do. He says, I know, I will just assume gravity obeys the Maxwell equations. It's as simple as that. Uh, and then he says, holy cow, if gravity obeys the Maxwell equations, I can explain inertia. This is looking like a profound result. And therefore, gravity explains inertia. And this is Siyama's pitch for a long time. 1957, he does it again. Scientific American article. The same, uh, the same syllogism. And, but there's no equations in Scientific American, so it's perfect for the hand waving. And it is a compelling result. Uh, and we'll get into that in a moment. So just to be specific, here's the laws of electromagnetism written in a form similar to what we saw the laws of gravity. Uh, same sort of deal, but here there's just four equations. There's one free index. So these are the Maxwell equations. There's just four of them the way they're written. Remember, gravity had 10. <clears throat> and this is the force law. This, this is sort of the F equals MA of electromagnetic forces. And the unique features are electromagnetic radiation and electromagnetic induction. Those are the attractive features. So 
But seriously, Dennis, gravity is nothing like electromagnetism. Let me count the ways. And here is, if you look at this list, you would say, you know, why would you assume they're the same? If I have an electric field with two different charges, the charges fall differently. If I have a gravitational field with two different masses, the masses fall the same. Uh, the force equation, acceleration is linear in the four velocity for electromagnetism, it's quadratic for gravity. F fundamental difference. The field equations here are nonlinear, here they're linear, and that's related to the fact that gravitational fields feel gravity. In electromagnetism, electromagnetic fields don't feel electric charge. Electromagnetic fields are neutral. So to really compare gravity to EM, you would want a flavor of EM where the electromagnetic fields are charged. Then you would get something that starts to look like gravity. Uh, there's no dipole moment in general relativity. Uh, also, the big one for me, it takes 10 numbers at every point in space and time to specify the gravitational field. For electromagnetism, it only takes four. So obviously, gravity is a lot more complex. And this assumption of Siyama is, is uh, weak because of these facts. And so, in 1969, the cheese really slips from the cracker. Because uh, this, he, uh, when I heard about this book, The Physical Foundations of General Relativity by Siyama, I thought, this is going to be it. It's going to look like this. But in fact, it's a, like a pamphlet. It's a little tiny book. And I'm comparing it with the meaning of relativity by Einstein. It's a little book. It's like four inches by six inches. And less than like the width of half a dime. These, this is the page count. The physical foundations of general relativity no Einstein equations. In fact, only Newton's laws. So physical foundation of general relativity, only Newton's laws. Again, he re resurrects the arguments in 1953. This time, he doesn't make the indefensible Maxwellian assumption. It's pure hand-waving. He just sort of backs into it. It is compelling, but even in 1969, uh, Shiyama recognizes the problem. At the end of the book, he admits that his calculation is neither strictly correct nor entirely correctable. So he wants to believe it, but he comes in at the end and he says, I can only hope it gives the correct order of magnitude. So, yeah. Can I, can I say something in defense of Shiyama? Sure, well, I'm not so done with him, but. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the uh, article in 1953, the original one in the monthly notices of the uh, London... Uh, uh, that is uh, work that he did during his uh, PhD uh, thesis and um, under uh, Iraq. Iraq. And uh, uh, Iraq only met once with him and uh, didn't think much of it, and uh, he did it as because he was really enthusiastic about it. And he, he, was, he, uh, he didn't stop there. As you remember, he, at the end of that article, he says he's going to have a following article where he's going to have a tensorial theory as opposed to the vector theory, which was in 1953. You're right, a lot of time went by, but let's be fair to him. In 1964, he has a tensorial theory which, uh, where he used advanced retarded waves. That's 1964, that's five years before this. And then in 1969, the same year as this, he comes with, a, with finally the second article, which is a fully tensorial theory and is non-local. And uh, this culminates in uh, 1974 or 72 by the work of Derek Reine, who has an article in the Proceedings of Barber uh, on, on this uh, uh, theory. It's a fully Mackin theory uh, and uh, it's non-local 
And uh, then he determined, for example, that certain universes, the Friedman, uh, uh, Robertson, Walker, Walker uh, is uh, one that satisfies the theory and is purely Machian. And then he rules out. And he rules out the a number of universes, got a solution, all the, all the uh, solutions that are singular in nature and so on. So, so, so this book was a book for the general public. He, has, he, ha, he did major work and uh, he did follow through and the, you know, the, the, uh, I don't want to take your time, so. Well, they, are you saying that in an alternative universe, yeah, how does the induction thing can be reconciled with general relativity? No, I'm saying that uh, that Lance uh, is correct in, uh, in what he said so far, that there is an issue uh, when uh, you have to take into account that the theory of gravitation has to be tensorial to be, to be, in agree, in consist, to be consistent with, with Einstein's theory, and, but uh, that uh, eventually Siama did that, and it became a, a non-local theory. Why does it have to be non-local? Because that is an issue that goes to this point. The Machian viewpoint is non-local in nature because those equations that you were showing, um, Lance, there's an issue with induction. Those equations that you showed earlier on, the 10 equations, the 10 independent equations, those are algebraic equations that hold at the point and it is purely local. And there is an issue with any Machian theory which bother not only Siama, it bother Tiki uh, uh, and so on, which uh, the, any Machian principle in nature is non-local. Because you're saying that, that... We're sort of getting out of bounds, I think. I mean, locality of this. Your point is that I'm being too hard on Siama. He actually took, took a college try at a tensorial theory. This book was written for a popular audience. We should probably leave that no, there. No, no, no. In, in 1969, he, he comes out with a fully tensorial theory, which mm. is non-local. And mm. that is, to be fair to Siama, that's the one that should be addressed. And that's what I'm unaware of that. So, yeah. Uh, as I recall hearing about Siama's stuff, it was, the argument was that if the gravitational effects are sufficiently weak, you can get away with these and linear things. Yep. Is that not correct? I'm going to get into that. I'm going to lay it all out uh, in just coming right up. So if I can hold that off and we'll hit it at the end. So, so okay. So, so to me, it's a puzzle. Uh, why didn't he just depart from the known laws of gravity? I guess you're saying he did. Didn't he did. see it. He did. Why didn't he find a suitable Maxwellian limit? Did he? Oh. Okay. He, concluded, uh, he concluded that the Maxwellian solution was uh, 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 intrinsically uh, not uh, viable for a number of reasons. Yeah. So this is a, this is puzzling uh, to me. Uh, not valid. Not viable. Oh, not viable. In, in general. Okay. But uh, it's a point that is very difficult to make. Like um, um, you were just making that. Uh, Maybe <coughs> in some context, the Maxwellian approach is valid. But if we are going to take that approach that, that it has to be fully general, right? It has to be a tensorial theory. And Siama said that in 1953, that he's going to have a tensorial theory. That's at the end of his article. Mm. Yeah. So he didn't change his mind. He all along, even when he, before he got his PhD, he was saying, hey, this is just the first approach. I'm going to come up with a tensorial theory. He does come up with it in 1969. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so perhaps I missed that, but I did find an interview with Siyama with Alan Lightman. Excellent interview. Yeah, so the, Alan Lightman himself is a respected physicist. He uh, did the interview for the American Institute of Physics Oral History Project, and I wanted to find something on Mach's principle, but they both knew I guess that it just didn't work and they didn't really hit on it. This is as close as they came when Siyama said, I liked Mach's principle, I was disappointed when it all went into the sand. 
So I'm not sure what he meant by the going into the sand, but it doesn't sound like a, a heroic triumph. <laughs> it sounds like he, yeah. <laughs> so, this, and then. This, this is what he means. Uh, yeah. The 1969 mm -hmm. uh, theory, if you, you said that general relativity was already too complicated because there are a couple nonlinear mm -hmm. equations that are entirely right. Well, I have some technical stuff to get into, but okay. just a, take 20 seconds to just summarize what you're, the point you're making about going into the sand. Uh, his 1969 theory is much more complicated and I, would, and I would say at this point impossible to solve num numerically because not only nonlinear partial differential but it's also non-logical. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one problem and, and uh, let's leave it there. Okay. That's going but I'm side. glad you're protecting Siyama because I am being hard on him. Very hard. Um, Siafalini and Wheeler, 95, they have this statement. An eminent physicist spent the last years of his life pushing the idea that gravitation follows the pattern of EM. We cannot accept, and the community of physics, quite rightly, does not accept. I thought they were talking about Siyama. They didn't say Siyama reviewed the book. He died a couple years later. So I had felt like it's just a puzzle. It's, uh, my picture is that he stuck to this Maxwellian thing to the bitter end and ended up sort of detaching himself from the I community. Of the last years of his life, but he hadn't died yet. Yes, I, 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 I respectfully disagree. Number, number one, the 1964 theory is not Maxwellian. The 1969 theory of Siyama is not Maxwellian. And he lived a long time between 1964 and 1969 until he died. So either Wheeler and Chief, maybe, I think Cifolini wrote most of the book, either Cifolini was not quite aware of the theories of Siama in the 1960s, or he referring to somebody else. Could be. I Did you have something else? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, but Wheeler, now Wheeler meets the sirens. He handles it differently. So every, probably we all know he's a luminary of 20th century physics, co-author of an early textbook on GR. This was his bumper sticker, matter tells space how to curve, space tells matter how to move. It has that Wheeler, you know, uh, sort of uh, repartee. Uh, he co-authored Gravitation and Inertia in 95 with Ciafolini. I hear a lot of Wheeler in it when I don't I don't know what Ciafolini sound like but it sure sounds like Wheeler talking to me. Anyway, they have a compact mathematical introduction to GR. They cover everything, the field equations and so on. It's very short, and then they get into inertia, and they this is exactly what we're doing. So these guys are looking for inertia within general relativity, very relevant to what we're doing. Uh, his bumper sticker is mass there, governs inertia here. He developed a complex mathematical initial value framework. I really couldn't make sense of it. It is the, it is the main approach to numerical relativity. When you were talking about uh, numerical relativity solutions, it's following all that approach. Because, like you were saying, the elliptic equations are the constraint equations. Therefore, you don't need to have any advanced retarded waves because that's already all there. And then you proceed step by step numerically. And that's all following the approach of Wheeler. So, okay. yeah. a final chapter in this, which I thought was so interesting. They do their thing, then they address the electromagnetic analogy in the final chapter. And so again, they have this statement, we cannot accept this thesis that gravity behaves like EM. <laughs> But nonetheless, <laughs> they also, they, they hear the sirens. There's an important lesson about gravity by treating it on the incorrect basis that it behaves like EM. And it's what they call this Siyama sum for inertia. They actually attribute it to him. And this is it here. And of course, uh, a lot of us know the meaning of this result, but this is derived from Newtonian physics. So it's not really valid, but the way that Wheeler approaches it is he says that this voting power, which is what he calls this, uh, follows from the care metric. <coughs> so for Wheeler, he saw this result, 
but he knew he couldn't assume EM. He had to find a way within the canon of general relativity, and he found it in the care metric in the weak field limit. Why the care metric is rotation? Why, why are we talking about care metrics here? Well, this is the, that is rotation. Rotational induction, maybe. This is what's well, in their book. Inertia, you know, inertia has two aspects. To yes. But to be yeah. fair to Jim, uh, because, as, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but as soon as his, his approach is mainly to the linear part, not yeah. the rotational part. There are a lot of errors associated with the linear part. They, they seem to understand the rotational a lot better than they do the linear. And there are actually mistakes in textbooks regarding the linear. The problem, problem is in the equation motion, the time derivative of the in electromagnetism, the vector potential. In the case of GR, it's the time derivative of G0R. And if the argument is made in the weak field, that term is zero, and it isn't. It's higher order. They reject it on the grounds that it's higher order, and therefore can be ignored. But because it's higher order, it doesn't mean that it can be ignored. Because there's a gigantic amount of stuff out there that produces an enormous scalar potential only which figures into that term of the equation of motion, and it gives you back all the inertial effects. But Lance is correct. You have to make some additional assumptions about the structure of GR, which are not commonly made. So, um, so, so again, uh, yeah, he ended up in the same weak way, like, you know, we don't have a sound theory. If we don't use a sound theory of gravity, we can't really talk about inertia, so. Yeah. What you find in chat is an argument for the elliptic constraint equation approach. Okay? And they argue that the reason why you should do this is because if you make integrations out the past lifetime of currents, matter currents, the equations are so messy that they are impossible to solve. Okay? And that's the reason why you should use the elliptic yeah. equation approach. Yeah. But they, are, they appreciate that Commercial induction really is present in GR. I would not, if I were you, argue that Kuthmi and Miller are arguing that there is no inertial induction in GR. No, oh, they're saying they don't have a theory to explain it if it is. That's what they're saying. <clears throat> they they want to believe it. They they hear the sirens, but they they can't do what Siyama did and say assume Maxwellian. It's sort of like the X Files. I want to believe. Yeah. Is okay. J a, a matter current there? Huh? J is J in the equation? A matter current. Yeah. Yeah. So the angular momentum. So. Oh, okay. Yes, it is. So, okay. <coughs> it's linear part. It's not yeah. angular part. No, the the curve metric. Metric. In the, yeah, the curve metric okay. there. I think he was talking about the J in the curve metric. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's the angular mm -hmm. momentum. So they're talking about angular. Inertia, not yeah, the, problem, yes. the problem with all of this is that the linear part is gets canceled in that term of equation of motion on the basis of it being a higher rate of term, uh -huh. and it therefore should can be ignored. But what I'm saying is, no, you can't ignore it because it's higher. Did you say that you can ignore it? No, the other proof of you don't say it can be ignored. But another major textbook from about the same time, Rufini and Ohanian, do say. Uh, and the guy who made the mistake was a guy named Ben Harris in the American Journal of Physics article in 1991. And I'll shut up, Lance, you can go ahead. I'm oh, taking a rest. But <laughs> <laughs> read the Jane Bez paper. It's still a 15 On inertia and general relativity. Okay. So that's the, we had the parable of Siyama. Uh, now let's get into the technical. Why, I guess Siyama didn't know this. He didn't have the modern textbooks. He didn't have Poisson and Will. Uh, I don't know, or as you said, he did it all right. But now we'll get into why there, I would say there is no Maxwellian gravity. So with the advantages of history and modern textbooks, these are the three reasons that I find. E any one of these is sort of a killer. But all three of these are true. One is the gauge freedom. 
You can see whatever you want in general relativity because of the enormous gauge freedom. You mean coordinate freedom? Coordinate. It's not gauge. I don't know why I keep saying gauge. Yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, linear theory, as I mentioned, does not provide an exchange of gravitational energy or momentum with matter. So, and the Maxwellian potentials are not radiative. So nothing holds together uh, on the Maxwellian analogy. And I'm going to take them a, one at a time. So this is a force equation in GR. It's written in this funny way as sort of a generalized derivative. But this would be conservation of energy alone. And then these two terms are the effects of gravity acting on a material system. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have just like dust or billiard balls, you can use this equation to get the geodesic equation. And a lot of people are more familiar with the geodesic equation as the equation of motion in general relativity. They're both equivalent. This one is the, is the fundamental one. So uh, this is the general force equation for any inertial, inertial induction of vice. A calculation starts here. Okay. Now. Carroll actually did the linear force equation. So Carroll did the hard work for us. He actually wrote down this equation in the linear limit. He decomposed uh, the metric. And let me just uh, make a note here. Um, I'm going to call uh, this G nu nu is the gravitational field. And it has, it's a 4 by 4 matrix. It's 4 by 4 is 16, but it's symmetric, so there's 10. Uh, this is the gravitational field. Um, this is a decomposition, so you, you convert this into a simple metric, which is the Minkowski, with just ones on the diagonal, plus a perturbation. And again, it's a 4 by 4. And this one is h, h mu nu. So, so we do this uh, perturbation. And uh, Carol says, let's give the components names that, that we might remember. So actually, he's going to give it a name. He's going to call the time time component phi. And he's going to call the, the ax, ay, az. I'm kind of writing sideways here. And then you've got the spatial components. So he is making this decomposition. He's going to solve the geodesic equation. And here's what he gets. And in fact, this is looking very electrodynamic. Uh, this is the F equals MA. There's sort of a, a gravito electric field. And there's a gravito magnetic field. And this electric field is the gradient minus the dA by dt. That's the term you always worry about, Jim. Here it is. Nothing up my sleeves. It's right here. Uh, they have, and also that the, the gravitomagnetic field is the curl of A. And so these two components are behaving very much, much like the uh, vector potential of electromagnetism which I'll call it as AU, but it's got these four components, three space components and a time component. Uh, then in terms of force equation, gravity looks very electromagnetic. Now, what about all this junk? Well, no one knows what this is. We haven't seen that before, so we don't worry about it so much, <laughs> right? It's just as big. But we don't know what it is. Yeah. So, but we focus on this and we say, aha, gravity's Maxwellian. Yeah. This stuff, who knows? So, I would say here's the bumper sticker. This, the linear geodesic equation, it looks similar to the Lorentz force law. There, the time time component of the perturbation behaves like an electric potential, the space components, the time space components behave like a magnetic vector potential. E and B are gravital electric and gravital magnetic fields. So uh, it does look like we have EM-like effects in general relativity. 
Uh, and in fact, we have our glass slippers. We're off to the Maxwellian ball. <laughs> but not so fast, Cinderella. We have found the gravitoelectric and gravitomagnetic force to first order in the geodesic equation. What do you mean by first order? First, uh, linear in H. In the perturbation? In the perturbation. See, like, so we've decomposed H into the phi, the A, X, A, Y, A, Z, and then the, the space space components. But it's all linear, there's nothing quadratic. So, so that's what I mean by first order. It's assuming a very weak gravitational field. Yes. So, uh, but as I said, to first order in the Einstein field equations, the matter obeys simple conservation of energy. This equation here. If you use linear gravity, then the matter does not couple to the gravitational field to that order. And here's your references. You can look Carol, Weinberg, and Poisson, and Will and read more about this. Can I write this, the reference of Siamma in, in theory? Yeah, you want me to write it? No, the one from 1969. Can I write oh. it? Oh, yeah, let's do it at the end. Okay. Okay, uh, so anyway, this is not intuitive, and I didn't learn this myself until just a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, after coming out of the APS meeting. So, there's... It does hold for gravitational waves. No, there is, there is, uh, there is but, energy in the space time in the gravitational waves. True. That, that equation there is a That's a. This is just uh, matter and energy. That's conservation of matter and energy. Which does not hold for well, gravitational waves. These guys say it does. It does. I mean, no look at these three references. So I'm reporting what's in the textbooks. If you do linear general relativity, there's no exchange of energy and momentum with the material system. Yes. Uh, not for gravitational waves. Gravi this is for matter. Yes. Uh, yes. But it's not does not hold for gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are time dependent. Wasn't that it's a higher order effect? No, 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 no. no, no. Not a higher order effect. Well, it's uh, an issue of this uh, equation calls for an isolated matter source that, mm -hmm. that is not oscillating in time. That, that conservation equation. If you have gravitational waves... No, this is time dependent. Yes, it's time dependent. Four, right? You got four values of you. X, Y, Z, and T, right? So... If you have, if you have a quadruple ball, yeah. and you have gravitational uh, waves, you have energy in space-time that is divorced from any matter. This was a big problem between the time that the yeah. Einstein recently wrote the article on gravitational waves until the Chapel Hill conference, and it was resolved by Pirani. You're sort of going down a different rabbit hole. We're not talking about the energy in gravitational waves. I'm talking about using the linear general relativity to describe the coupling of the distant universe yep. with a local system. You can't use the linear theory because this is conservation of energy in the linear theory. And I would refer you to these references. It's not intuitive to me, but it's in all the textbooks. It's an important point, and certainly this group should understand it. All those references I agree with you just yeah. said. It's <laughs> And the issue is well, that if you have, if you have why do you make a case? That well, if you want to make, make a comment, uh, yeah. you made a comment about it. Okay. If you have a shell of material, mm. and you know its mass at a distance, that is in the sports shield net, the mass at the distance is not going to change due to the dynamic slope. If it collapses and gains mm. kinetic energy, then something must be taking up the mass, something must be adding a, reducing the mass of the particles, yeah. otherwise the mass at the distance yeah. will, will change. 
That's just an elementary result. Yeah. You know, we're, we're talking about the equivalence principle versus the, the strong versus the weak. Yeah. And it's my understanding that is still unresolved. Well, all I'm saying is that gravity if you... It's the mass of the particles <laughs> with the gravity field. Uh, yeah, it's a deep... It's a deep hole to go down. And like I said, that's why I wanted to put references. You can research it yourself. But the point is that you can't use a linear general relativity of any kind to describe an exchange of energy and momentum between a material system and the gravitational field. But I can cite a simple example but, where it does occur that the yeah. particles making up the shell are collapsing and gaining kinetic energy. I mean, you've, yeah. got, you've got to add the kinetic energy now to the mass of the distance. Are you just making the mass of the distance stay the same? It no. has to be the mass of the particles is getting smaller. And that's an elementary result. Are you saying you disagree with these results? Yes, I do. Okay. If it, if it, if it, if it <laughs> says the mass of the distance is changing, mm -hmm. when it doesn't change. Can I make a technical point again? Clarify that my first order, first order in a, Yes, yeah, that's what I mean by order. Well, then, but, oh, point is well taken because linear in a includes gravitational waves, which contain energy. Oh, uh, there's the problem is, and again, if you look at these references that the ordering on the left-hand side of the field equations, if you linearize the left-hand side of the field equations, that order is the zeroth order on the right-hand side. So, if you're looking at the material system, you can have exchange of momentum and energy to linear order in the equation of motion, and I just showed it. But I'm saying, that to use that equation, that Maxwellian Lorentz force looking thing, you need the fields. You have to plug the fields in. And to get the fields, you have to solve the field equations to second order. That's what these guys tell you. Question about second order. That Carroll equation you showed, the last term was V mu, V mu. That doesn't work first order. Uh, that's in the velocity of the particle. Yeah. yeah. But, it's but it's kind of like a V cross B, V cross B like a V cross B, that's the velocity. That's not first order. No, no, what are you saying by first order? Uh, in the perturbation. In the, in the perturbation. Not in V, OK? OK. Well, we've got six minutes. Uh, is that right? Sorry. OK. <laughs> okay, uh, wait, let's, let me go to Jim here and then, then to John. My, my quick comment on this is that Einstein said, solved the field of what he called Lockean effects back in 1921. It's in his Princeton lectures, which are published as the main of relativity. It's around right page 100, several pages there. And what you find is the increased equations, he finds the same thing that Carroll does. Because the important term in Carroll is the DADT term. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, what is the potential A? And it's the integration of matter currents over whatever region you're considering. He was considering spectator matter. And he came to the conclusion that there is inertial induction as a consequence of that term. He did not compare the integration out to cosmological distances because he didn't know how to do it. But when Wheeler and Kufalini did it, they knew that they wanted to make the case for the elliptic constraint approach as opposed to messy integrations out of the gas light curve. Yeah. So the reason why Carol and these guys are saying, no, the matter doesn't come to gravity, I suspect is because of Harris's argument. No, they don't care. They don't know anything about Harris. I mean, right. this is. Uh, I would, I would invite anyone who's questioned in this, look at these three references. I have two of them right here. It's sort of a deep thing. I don't think I can ex make you satisfied. I wouldn't have known it myself if I hadn't read the textbooks. But it's in all the textbooks. I have those three references at home. Yeah. Right. So. I, I, I look at them, but, yeah. and I agree that 
for example, Weimar was at MIT written in 1972, way before the Harris article. So definitely, yeah. you're going to say that Weimar wrote that because yeah. of Harris, yeah. unless he had a time machine. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 what, everything that Weimar says, I, I agree. Like he never, but he, actually, Weimar says that that equation that you have there applies only under certain con situa conditions. The, that, that is only a conservation of energy under restricted yeah. conditions. Yeah. It doesn't apply to gravitational I've, waves. OK, I think we have to move on. I, I'm going to let John have the last word. <laughs> Lance, I want to commend you for doing this. This stuff is extremely complicated. However, I just return to that simple Gedanken experiment of watching a shell of inert material collapse in well, a black hole, yeah. and the mass of the distance does not change. But look, at, I, I'm just reporting, there are textbooks. And that's such a simple concept. I, I, and if you're telling me that these people are saying but let me that the kinetic for, energy does not contribute to the mass of the distance. No, let me argue for, for Lance here, because I'm not simple. That is, in, it, they have it, that is. In, okay, but then what, what, what happens to the, why does the mass of the distance it, it, not change? Guys, I'm going to move on because we're not going to converge. It's in these textbooks. <laughs> can I ask a quick question? Uh, how many more slides do you have? Uh, I have. Uh, I'm contemplating giving you an extra slot later on. I mean, this would be a good summary. Um, I have my summary at the end, but on this intermediate point, um, you can't use linear gravity to describe inertial induction. So I'm not saying that it's not out there, I'm not saying it doesn't help us build intuition, but it's mathematically it's not justifiable for the mainstream community. If there's an effect in general relativity, they're going to want to see the derivation from the equations of general relativity. And we can't use linear general relativity to do it. So, do you want me to stop there? One comment, um, uh, Kenneth Nordfeld, I believe, does, does use induction. I mean, he, do, he sort of gets away with it. And, and he's, he's trying to explain that he can't believe it's Kenneth Nordfeld. 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 He says it, it has to be there because he can't derive some very basic. Well, he he's yeah. There's remember there's gravitational magnetism, so we have to be careful on what we're talking about. But I think she's she's talking about the use yeah. of BPM and the normal yeah. some extra terms and the BPM. Yeah. By the way, when when I'm trying to derive uh, energy basic equations. I was using the fully tensorial theory of the Boyle molecule, and, and it does have a limit that, that reduces to Einstein's theory. So mm. it is a viable approach. It wasn't linear the way I did it. It was complete. It's no. It's just so you know, this equation can be got out of a, a totally nonlinear theory of tensors. Mm. But it is that theory consistent with. It's consistent with general relativity. I, I'm uh, going to be talking about uh, that could be the side of my talk. Yeah. 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 I think I can finish it in 10 minutes. Can I just take the last? Let me just finish it because, yeah. So. As long as there are no interruptions. Okay. So. I'm going to tell you why you see Maxwellian field equations. Gauge freedom makes general relativity into a hall of mirrors. Okay, so we have to say a few words. And I know people, they have their own ideas about what gauge means and so on. But if you read the textbooks, what I'm going to show you now is what they say. And I'm going to start, whoops, with the Maxwell equations. Because we all know what gauge freedom is in Maxwell equations. So here we go. Four equations in four unknowns. Uh, the unknown is the vector potential. However, from conservation of charge, the divergence of the charge is zero. So we're not creating or destroying charge. So we have a constraint on the field equations. And if you, that's, this is one equation. So the four Maxwell equations are not independent. They obey one constraint equation, this guy, among the four unknowns, and therefore, you only have three independent equations 
in the four unknowns. You need a fourth equation to close the system and that is the gauge freedom. The fourth equation in the four unknowns comes from the choice of gauge. It's one free equation chosen to make life easier. There are many gauges to choose from. Um, and I'll note that gauge is only a problem when dealing with the potentials. It doesn't affect the force equations. So that's gauge freedom in electrodynamics. Now let's look at Einstein equations. Okay, 10 equations in 10 unknowns. The metric tensor. Okay, 10 equations, 10 unknowns. However, from conservation of energy momentum, the divergence of this thing is zero. We have a constraint on the field pieces here. And in fact, obviously, this is the Bianchi identities, but it's the same thing. The 10 Einstein equations are not independent. They, they obey four constraint equations. This is four equations here among the 10 unknowns. So therefore, there's only six independent equations in the Einstein equations. We need four more equations to close the system. The extra four equations is the choice of coordinates, the space and time. Three space, th three space dimensions, one time dimensions. These, and sometimes they call it gauge. This is gauge freedom in GRs, the choice of coordinates. So there are four free equations among the 10 unknowns that you have to invent to solve the system. So if we roll it up, in electromagnetism, one out of the four potentials is arbitrary. 25% of the field equations are arbitrary by some way, of, a measure of thinking. In general relativity, 40% of the field equations are arbitrary. So you're solving 10 equations, you get to invent four of them. So is it any wonder that you can see whatever you want? Uh, yeah. so. You can see whatever you want, but it's not all real. So, here's a linearized field equations taken out of Weinberg. You linearize to make life simple, but it's a mess. It's a terrible mess. Who would want to solve that? Uh, so you're desperate. You'll sell your soul for some simplification, and you choose harmonic gauge. If you choose harmonic gauge, this guy, all these terms drop away. You get a nice wave equation uh, in, for each component of the metric, there's a wave equation. Uh, this, my notation here is del squared minus the second partial time derivative. And I've written the Maxwell analog, you can see they're very similar. We've got the wave equation on the vector potential equals the source. Here it's the wave equation on the perturbation equals the source. Looks very good a wave equation for each component of H, but it's an illusion of the gauge. It's not real. What is real and what is gauge? Uh, with four of the 10 field equations freely chosen, we want to isolate the six true gravitational pot uh, potentials. This is the true gravitational field. And we do this by considering gauge invariant potentials. You can choose a set, a gauge that doesn't change when you do a gauge transformation. And this was in Poisson and Will's book. It's not explicit in the other textbooks, but it is in Poisson and Will. And they allow you to identify the six true degrees of freedom of the gravitational field. Poisson and Will call it Coulomb gauge. Carroll calls it transverse gauge. Um, I will follow Poisson and Will 555. So, I'm about to show you the true, gravi the true linear gravitational field equations. If you see what's on the rest of this slide, you won't believe in Maxwellian gravity anymore. So, is there anyone that needs to leave the room? And you can, <laughs> you can, you can eat your hamburger and know that there's Maxwellian gravity. Okay, so. So this is what Poisson and Will do. They write down the field equations, they linearize, they give everything a name, just like uh, Carroll did, but they also pay attention to the spatial components. Remember those ones that we didn't know what yeah. they were? Poisson and Will pay attention. Yeah, the ones are swept under the rug. So 
they call out the trace, they call phi the trace of the spatial components, and that's uh, the stuff in here, the space-space components. And then there's a trace-free part, that's what the TF means. So it's a decomposition of the space parts. Here's the potential invariant gauge, what, what uh, they call transverse or Poisson gauge. That's the gauge choice. And you can see it's four equations, there's three here and one here. So it closes the system. The true degrees of freedom, the things that are really moving in gravity is the time-time component, the trace of the spatial components, two of the vector space components, and only two out of that whole trace-free part. These are the true degrees of freedom of the gravitational field in the linear approximation. And here are the gauge invariant field equations. And you can see Laplacian, Laplacian, Laplacian. This is the equation of soap bubbles. There's no radiation here. The only radiation is down here in those space-space components that we didn't know what to do with. But the time component, phi, uh, the spatial, the time-space components, A, they obey Laplace's equation. There is no radiation, no wave nature. This is the true nature of the gravitational field in the linear approximation. And this is what, when they detect gravitational waves, this is what they're seeing. It's this piece here. So, I'm a, in electromagnetism, all four potentials are radiative. They obey a wave equation. And three are true degrees of freedom. It's a very radiative, wavy system. Gravity, only six of the ten potentials are radiative, and of those, only two are true degrees of freedom. The potentials that produce Maxwellian forces in the linear geodesic equation are not radiative. So, I think that's the end of Maxwellian gravity. So, the linear geodesic equation does look sort of electromagnetic, I'll grant you but that's where the similarity stops. And again, the three reasons that we can't have Maxwellian gravity, there's no exchange of energy and momentum with matter from in the field equations. We couldn't treat inertial induction in linear GR. The true gauge invariant potentials are not Maxwellian at all. They're sui generis, if I'm pronouncing that right. That means they're unique. There's nothing like them. We don't have an, al an analogy. And the Maxwellian light components, the stuff that looked Maxwellian in the force equation, are non-radiative. They're just static. They're determined by boundary conditions. So, this is the slide I showed at the beginning, and this is where I'll end my talk. Uh, I think, yeah, these are all the things we debated. I think I've gone through everything to make my case for why there is no Maxwellian gravity. So I'll stop there. Ten after.